All right. Today is, all right, thank you. Today is Thursday, February 25th. It's two o'clock and this is a public hearing for the Mobile City Planning Commission to hear comments regarding a proposed new zoning ordinance, also known as the Unified Development Code. The meeting will proceed according to the agenda. Each speaker will be admitted into the meeting one at a time and be announced by staff. In accordance with the Planning Commission's operating rules and procedures, each speaker will be limited to five minutes. A buzzer will sound at four minutes to signal that the speaker has one minute to conclude their remarks. At the end of five minutes, another buzzer will sound at which point the speaker will be finished. It should be noted that each speaker was provided this information along with the Zoom link to participate in this meeting. At the conclusion of this meeting, the commission will schedule a business meeting to discuss the comments and further review the proposed UDC. Commission members and staff, please remember to keep your microphone on mute unless you are speaking to the meeting attendees. Um, for commissioners, just uh, on our question in general uh, regarding the speakers, we're gonna try to reserve question answerings with one another and whatnot until our business meeting. Uh, so we don't really want to engage in long question answer sessions with the uh, speakers. Thank you. Roll call myself, Ms. Libby Latham, Mr. Jennifer, I mean, Ms. Jennifer Denson, Mr. Clark Blackwell, Ms. Shirley Sessions. Here. Ms. Allen Cameron. Mr. Taylor Atchison. Here. Mr. Matt Anderson. Here. Mr. Nick Omberger. Here. And Ms. Bess Rich. Here. Mr. Don Hembry. Here. And Mr. Jay Stubbs. Here. And we have a quorum. Uh, we have the agenda before us. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. So moved. Second. second. Properly moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor of adoption of the agenda? Aye. 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 The polls agenda is adopted. Uh, next, we'll have our public hearing. However, I believe there's some uh, initial comments that are great mayor would like to make to us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Now this is a very, very significant and big day for Bill Mobile and also for the city of Mobile. Now building up to this day, I wanna really thank the uh, planning commission for all that you've done uh, as we've led up to this and all that you do on an ongoing basis for the city but specifically regarding the UDC, the work the staff has done has been unparalleled, certainly during my administration, possibly other administrations uh, leading up to this. And I also wanna thank all the citizens individually uh, and collectively the organizations that they represent for the heartfelt uh, passion that they've expressed themselves trying to um, you know, make the city of Mobile what they believe to be a better place to live. I think that's ultimately what we're all trying to do here. What we know is, is that the existing uh, UDC that we have, or the codes that we have are, you know, they're 60 years old, been modified on numerous occasions, but they're outdated. Certainly they're contradictory and they're also very confusing. And we believe this is detrimental to uh, what we would call measured and controlled growth. And over the last three years, countless man hours by the staff, countless man hours by citizens and experts, not just inside the city, but outside of the city. I really can't think of anything that we have undertaken that has had a sustained conversation going on for three years, pointing up to the document that we're trying to approve. Um, you know, this, the, the document that we're offering up uh, for our consideration, it's simplified, it's predictable, 
Um, and when I say that, it means that from a development process that you really don't have to know and be familiar with what's happened in Mobile in the past to be able to come in and read this document, the, the current uh, offered up UDC and know what the guardrails are on how you will go forward. You know, but even though that's significant uh, for someone on outside of the city, more importantly, it's just as significant that uh, internally, we know that we are endeavoring to protect our neighborhood fabric. Uh, you know, really without impeding, you know, new construction, you know, really in the areas where we need it the most. You know, this will have a positive impact on uh, job growth, on de economic development. You know, while at the same time, we believe protecting our neighborhoods and paving the uh, way for revitalization of the oldest parts of our cities. You know, additionally, very importantly, it's got some new provisions in it for protecting Mobile's natural resources and environmentally sensitive areas. So, you know, as I think about where we are and what we tried to do, you know, this has been like um, a, a balance um, that you would use in chemistry lab. You know, you put a, a chemical on one side and you put a weight on the other side. And so how do you balance this thing so that everybody involved, you know, is going to end up in a better place than where they are today. We know this, we know it doesn't have everything that each of you want. But we also know that we've done the very best we could to get it to where it is. And so if we can pass the UDC as it's presented today, or will be presented today, uh, and eventually to the city council, we feel like it's the framework, it's the foundation, you know, for us being able in years to come to address changes. And the, those changes won't be encumbered with all the baggage that's attached to the existing UDC. So again, I'll say it doesn't solve every problem that we have, nor does it address every opportunity we have, but it's a whole lot better than what we do have. And so it's a giant step forward. We think it's the necessary step forward. And so I hope everybody, the, uh, the planning commissioners, as well as those making their remarks, will keep that in mind. So again, once again, thank everybody for your participation. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll now have a public hearing to take public comment on whether the commission should recommend to the Mobile City Council that the Unified Development Code. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, if I could, I'll, I'll just make a, a few brief remarks and then we can move into the public hearing phase. All right. Okay. Um, okay. For the record, uh, my name is Shayla Biko and I'm the director of the Bill Mobile Department. Today is a big day, one that is many years in the making. After four years and hundreds of meetings, we present to you a new zoning code that we think will be a giant step forward for our city. It's a code that I believe you'll be excited to recommend to city council to adopt as law. But I expect that you'll hear from folks who are less enthusiastic about the UDC. So let me be the first to say it's not perfect, but it is an important first step and it has come about through a very rigorous and genuine process. I'd like to spend a few minutes providing some important context for the UDC. As you consider feedback and a potential recommendation, I hope you'll keep in mind three points. Our current code is over 50 years old. It is antiquated, hard to administer, lacks many modern best practices, and does not fully comply with legal requirements. Put simply, it's broken, and it's not serving anyone well. The draft UDC may not completely satisfy everyone, but it is a giant step forward. There are many different viewpoints in our community, and it's not always possible to reconcile that but the UDC achieves a balance of possible with practical and it contains things for everyone. And adopting the UDC is a first step, not the last. More improvements can come. We have to start somewhere. 
We believe this UDC creates a platform that we can continue to build upon. So how did we get here? It's been a long road, four years or more in the making, beginning with Map for Mobile, our call to action that made updating the, the code a community priority. We officially began the UDC process in 2016, and since that time, there have been over 75 small group and neighborhood meetings, dozens of stakeholder sessions, and advisory committee meetings throughout each phase of the process. We tallied over 1,300 unique public comments to our online portal, and many more were submitted in other ways. And we've listened. In early 2019, we made a significant effort to get feedback on the full draft of the mm -hmm. proposed rewrite, which we call version two. At the time, we believed that draft was close to being ready for adoption, but the community felt differently. Based on hundreds of comments of concern, we realized that we needed, we needed to go back to the drawing board on some ideas. That effort led to the significantly re revised and improved version three in early last year. With COVID, we convened virtual meetings and promoted them through email, word of mouth, and a social media campaign. And again, we got a lot of feedback, which we used to refine, refine the UDC before you now. As I mentioned earlier, there are many points of view in our community and sometimes their interests are at odds with each other. Those who care about the UDC are very passionate. Most of the feedback we received was extremely detailed, thoughtful, and helpful. Some of it pointed in the same direction, but some of it conflicted. The proposed UDC strikes a balance, giving everyone something, but no one everything. But that doesn't mean we haven't listened and heard. We responded to feedback in a report that groups similar comments, identifies potentially conflicting comments, and notes whether a change was made in the UDC and why. And remember, the UDC is a huge improvement over our current regulations. All facets of our community will find things to like. We provided the commission with a brochure that describes these benefits for neighborhoods, for the development community, for our city's economy, and for our natural environment. But the UDC is not a silver bullet, a cure for all our challenges. Here's what zoning and land development reg regulations can do. They can set minimum standards for site design, building design, permitted uses, parking and access, lighting, landscaping, et cetera. It can support quality urban design standards. It applies to new development and redevelopment where there's substantial modification. And it, and it sets requirements for applications, public notice and input review and approval. but it can't remove existing property rights or force existing development to change. New standards are not retroactive. It cannot regulate issues beyond those controlled by the city of Mobile, and it cannot regulate stormwater, litter, or blight. I also wanna help put the concerns about the UDC in context. The UDC contains 14 articles and an appendix. Most of the recurring concerns involve a handful of subsections with two, with two of those articles. Some consistent themes are site connectivity and building design, overlay designations, or for settled issues like above ground storage tank, tanks. In the scope of the UDC, the points of concern are relatively focused. I would encourage you to not let those concerns overshadow the entire Unified Development Code. Today's hearing is a big first step, but we don't expect action today. This commission will make a recommendation at a future hearing. Then at a separate hearing, City Council will consider formally adopting the ordinance. 
So today is a first step, but also adopting the UDC is a first step. It's a beginning, not an end. Zoning codes are not meant to live 50 years. With the pace of change in the world today, successful cities frequently test, update, and refine their re regulations. Sure, the UDC could be different, perhaps improved in some ways, but perfection can be the enemy of progress. The proposed UDC will move Mobile forward. We must take this first step before we can get better. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your comments. Um, Ms. We shall proceed now to our public com comments. Staff, how are we going to handle this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will admit, admit each speaker one at a time. I will uh, announce their admittance into the meeting, make sure that they can hear us and we can hear them. Then once they begin speaking, we will set the timer for four minutes and then the additional minutes so they have their total five minutes speaking time. I have admitted Ms. Becca Shaw into the meeting. Ms. Shaw, can you unmute? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, you can begin addressing the commission now. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, commission. My name is Becca Shaw. I'm a broker at Keller Williams and a local real estate investor. I live and I work in Midtown. Uh, thank you to the planning commission today and specifically to Shayla and Margaret for the opportunity to speak in support of the Unified Development Code. I sat on the technical advisory committee and witnessed the effort Shayla and her team have put forth in getting the city's code up to par or at least up to today. With it being over 50 years old and created in a time before technology was around, I am seeing firsthand the benefits that adopting the proposed UDC would have for our community, our environment, our neighborhoods, and our local development. Specifically in the real estate and development community, the UDC provides a modern and flexible approach to regulation. While it does require more research and a little more effort upfront for builders and developers, it does provide a much more predictable and consistent approval process, which is something I think we all agree is necessary. This should greatly minimize unforeseen development delays and unnecessary costs, resulting in a more cohesive relationship between the city and developers. Overall, the UDC will make city government more predictable, consistent, and efficient. Breaking this down a bit, what does that mean? That means there'll be fewer situations that will require a full public hearing shortening approvals by working directly with city admin. It means an efficient and consolidated document where information is straightforward and easily found by all. There's also flexibility with new planned developments that did not exist prior to this overhaul. Most important to the, con to the continued growth of downtown, there are new options for residential and mixed use projects in the downtown waterfront and maritime mixed use districts. In closing, our 50-year-old zoning code needs an overhaul to follow the 2015 adoption of the map for Mobile. Community input was key in the many, many revisions and updates as it was for the map for Mobile process and adopting the UDC will allow for a streamlined and updated approach to all aspects of Mobile's continued growth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and your support. Margaret, who do we have next? Mr. Chairman, I have admitted Mr. Casey Pipes into the meeting. Mr. Pipes, can you hear? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, we're ready. Thank you. The uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Casey Pipes, uh, 2255 Ashland Place. Um, I'm a land use zoning lawyer and probably one of the few people that's read all four of the draft codes as it's come through the process. I've been involved with the uh, process on behalf of the Mobile Area Association of Realtors since 16 or 7, 2017. 
And uh, I'd like to thank the city staff, the, uh, the contractors the city's used, and uh, the employee labor that's uh, dedicated a tremendous amount of time to the project. Certainly not an easy project to tackle. And, uh, you know, the, uh, there've been a lot of comments that, that, the, that have come from the Association of Realtors that have resulted in what we think are positive changes to this document. And, uh, you know, I'd like to publicly thank the staff and contractors for that. You know, there is a concern, you know, uh, all the time when there is a zoning code change, because when any city changes a zoning code, uh, it could possibly discourage development or investment. And you only know this kind of by the sound of your phone not ringing. And so it's always a concern when the rules are going to change. And so uh, I'm sure the city appreciates the level of interest that the uh, realtors had. These are the people representing the landlords and tenants, the buyers and sellers of of all the businesses and property owners in the town pretty much. So they're a very large stakeholder in this process. The, there is one comment that the Realtors uh, Association would like me to make uh, as a edit to this draft document, and it's to incorporate the concept of good or positive aspects of a development. Uh, there are many things in the draft before you that talk about the approval criteria for different types of zoning related applications that could come before you. And it's what you would expect, you know, does this cause harm? Does this hurt other people? Does this do other things that are all negative? And there's no consideration to uh, allow much less require the decision-making body to consider the positive aspects of a development, the community need for a type of project or development, the inherent good brought about by a project. And while it's certainly appropriate to consider the negative aspects of a project, we believe you also must be able to weigh those against some benefit or some good or some purpose behind the project. I know from being involved in different land use zoning applications that a lot of times the justification for a zoning change is simply the good that would come about or the need for a particular project. And I believe those considerations can be considered, can be weighed with the burdens and, and costs of a project to, to reach a decision that is uh, that balances these needs between uh, pro or, or, or anti-development uh, forces. But without being able to consider the positives, I think you've, this version of the code sets a very uh, difficult road ahead for rezonings to facilitate uh, positive change in the city. Um, and we've suggested language that doesn't go through and edit a lot of different sections because this comes up on all the different forms of uh, procedures, but we suggest one clean section at the bottom of uh, chapter five and 64, 512 that allows for a consideration of the benefits of a project. So uh, we've made that language available to the staff, uh, if there's a motion to approve this, we'd like it to include a motion to recommend approval subject to the Mobile Area Association of Realtors comments about considering the benefits. But again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And again, thank you to the staff for all the hard work you did to get us here. Thank you, sir. Um, Margaret, who's next? I'm admitting Ms. Casey Callaway into the meeting. Ms. Callaway, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear. Okay, you can begin now. Ms. Callaway, we're ready when you are. I, 
Thank you. I'm here. Um, I want to first off start with Mobile Baykeeper supports the passage of the EDC for 2021. Um, and I'm Casey Calloway, director and of Mobile Baykeeper, and my address is 17 North Reed Avenue, Mobile, and the office is downtown Mobile, 450C Government Street. So we are so grateful for the years and the great expense that the city has taken to pull this effort together. We appreciate how many groups and individual meetings, how many emails, phone calls, and frankly, those conversations on the street corner that y'all have taken to ensure the community understood the changes you were making, felt connected to the process, and connected to the document itself. Um, this is no easy thing for a regular person to read, and I think y'all have done a phenomenal job making it very accessible, so thank you. I'll say um, Mobile Baykeeper participated proudly in every one of these meetings from the very beginning. Um, the mayor mentioned at Rotary Club today three years, but I would absolutely say this started in 2015. All of us know and have been a part of the different meetings, the different processes, the tabling events, the, the real way that the city of Mobile has brought us together to figure out what do we want to see for our community and for our city. What y'all have come up with is a document that Mobile Baykeeper can support, one that prepares the city for growth but that also includes timely updates that enable us to enter the 21st century and the joys and challenges that that brings. We are grateful for the vast improvements made um, since the last significant overhaul in 1965 and I guess 1991, the little, up, uh, little updates. Um, but the new additions that we see and the real focus on protecting the environment because the environment is the biggest reason we believe that people live in coastal Alabama and in the city of Mobile in particular riparian buffer zones, landscape minimum setbacks, zoning overlay districts codified for the villages of Spring Hill, but also added for, the Af for Africatown, for the peninsula, and for the historic districts. We are excited about the creation of the maritime district so that we can very clearly see what is, what is the maritime industry, what is waterfront property, how do, we, how do we manipulate the two to make sure we're protecting both. We love that there's separate language around so many different industrial development sectors so that it cleans up that language. You know how to apply. And for us, we know how to say, this isn't the right kind of project for our community or to say it's here. So we're gonna move forward with it. I think overall, we see one major change and room for improvement on a few topics. The one major change we see needed with the document in the future is that this plan needs to set us up to improve sites over time. While we completely understand that if a single family home has been on a plot in a neighborhood for 50 years, it should be that just as a warehouse or an above ground storage tank should be. But if the site is changed by any significant, per, any significant percentage, there should be requirements for the site to be improved, kind of similar to the coastal zone management laws relative to a hurricane. But what we want to do is give you all a minute to celebrate the passage of this document before we sit back down and continue yeah. to address the issues that strengthen those buffer zones. Um, we want to strengthen buffer zones. We want to improve landscape minimums. We want to see how the zoning overlay areas work to imp and improve them. Um, we and improve them in conjunction and in connection with those communities as we see both Africatown and the peninsula grow and, and improve. Last thing I want to say is, again, another big thank you. Thank you to the City of Mobile staff, Shayla, Margaret, the brilliant city attorneys who've been a part of this process, to the consultants, also to the leadership of the City Council, the Planning Commission, and the Mayor for recognizing the need to deal with this document. And then the last thing I want to say is a huge thank you to the people who have written those 1,300 comments. The community has been engaged in this process. It's been technical and difficult and everyone has stood up and done the right thing for us. So thank you very much for the, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your comments and time. Um, who's next? I'm admitting Clinton Johnson Jr. into the meeting. Mr. Johnson, can you hear us? Yes, I can now. Okay, you can begin speaking anytime now. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Clinton Johnson Jr. And I'm here for Alabama Power Company located at 150 St. Joseph Street in downtown Mobile. 
As you know, Alabama Power owns nearly 100 tax parcels in the city of Mobile and has private easements with power lines and power equipment that it owns, maintains, and operates to provide electric service on literally every parcel of land in the city that has electric service. What the city does regarding the zoning code will most certainly impact Alabama Power, and if Alabama Power is impacted, then its customers will also be directly or indirectly impacted. Because of this, we have been actively engaged with the city's zoning code rewriting process. We have been happy to see several of our previous comments and requests incorporated in, draft, in drafts. And I want to, and we want to publicly thank Shayla Biko and the rest of the city staff for their hard work on this very difficult project. However, we still have several important issues which remain unresolved. These issues are material to Alabama Power's ability to provide safe, reliable and affordable electricity to the residents and businesses in the city of Mobile. If the city's zoning code fails to adequately address all four of these issues, then it could have an adverse effect on how we conduct business within the city. The first issue pertains to the newly imposed limits on where Alabama Power can lo locate its utility facilities. The draft zoning code, which is before you make substantial changes from the current zoning code by prohibiting what it defines as major utility facilities in most of the city. And by, not, and by not allowing them by any right in any part of the city. Under the current zoning code, facilities that would qualify as a major utility, like a substation of any size, are allowed by right in six zoning districts. And they are also allowed as conditional uses in every other district. These facilities are not prohibited anywhere. So while it is true that the proposed zoning code does not change the zoning district classifications for Alabama Power's 100 or so parcels, the proposed zoning code certainly makes a very material change to what Alabama Power can do on these parcels and what Alabama Power can do on well over half of the real estate in the city of Mobile. Utility infrastructure is needed where, where it is needed and reliability standards and engineering considerations dictate that the electricity infrastructure must be spread out around the city. We have submitted com comments to the city to address this issue as well as other issues that, the, that relate to the placement of our utility infrastructure. A second critical issue is the regulation of telecommunications equipment used by utility companies. Album Power uses advanced telecommunication systems to perform electric meter reading, monitor for meters, on, or customer service problems. They, we use it to open and close switches and breakers to help control and direct the flow of power, monitor the system, and support public safety initiatives. These telecommunication advancements and infrastructure will only increase with time and with new technologies. The city's current zoning code and small cell ordinance does not discourage this type of utility related telecommunications technology or require permits to install these types of things. The draft code before you, however, takes a different approach and puts the city in the role of regulating this issue and determining where, if, and how we can use modern telecom telecommunications technology to operate our network safely, efficiently, and reliably. We have requested a categorical exemption for all utility companies that provide gas, electricity, water, public safety, and sewer services from all the telecommunications regulations of this zoning code. The third issue is related to the unnecessary and costly regulation pertaining to stream crossings. Alabama Power is committed to protecting the environment, but there is simply no justification for Alabama Power to perform a hydraulic no-rise analysis to prove that an overhead power line crossing a stream 20 feet or more above ground or four feet or more below the bed of the stream would not cause an increase in the flood water height. This no rise hydraulic analysis requirement would not benefit anyone or the environment and will only add costs and delays to Alabama, Alabama Power's infrastructure projects. We have previously proposed the language to resolve this issue. And the fourth issue is the site lighting. This issue also relates to increased costs, but these are the types of costs that will directly be felt by Alabama Power's customers rather than indirectly through higher electricity rates. Alabama Power provides affordable security and site lighting to thousands of customers in Mobile. The City of Mobile is an Alabama Power lighting customer with over 19,000 lights attached to Alabama Power poles. Version four of the UDC was significantly changed this by limiting light pole heights, requiring the installation of additional poles and requiring service to most light poles to be placed underground. This will lead to substantially higher installation costs that would be directly passed on to residents and business owners in Mobile who request the light. We have asked for a revision to remove these offending terms while still keeping the other protections about lights not shining across property lines and similar matters. I ask that you please take a moment to and take our comments seriously. And if you make a motion to recommend approval 
We ask that you please make your motion subject to the changes requested by Alabama Power Company. Uh, if you need further into insight to these comments, I can provide them to you individually. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Mr. Staff? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I've admitted Debbie Foster into the meeting. Ms. Foster, can you hear us? Yes, I can. You're ready to go. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. As usual, I'm here representing two different groups. The first one, I need to apologize to you because there was, um, when I first signed up to speak to you, the peninsula of Mobile was listed as an opposition. That is not the case. The peninsula of Mobile does support passage of version four of the UDC. That is based on our overlay district and we are thrilled about that. I want to add to what everyone else has said, thanking Shayla and the team, Margaret, Bert, the team about what they've done to, over, to overhaul this thing, it's a mess. And so that has been a, a heck of an effort they've undergone. It's been incredibly confusing. I joined Casey Pipes in being probably a, among the few who have read every page of this thing for four or five years now. So anyhow, with that said, the Peninsula thanks you very much. We are grateful for the overlay district. However, we still have some issues. So I'm gonna change hats because the issues are the same as what happens with Dog River. And I hope that you will indulge me just a moment uh, with time because of the two different groups. For over 26 years, Dog River Clearwater Revival has been the, the group that has handled and looked over the water quality of Dog River. We have a watershed management plan that was developed and identifies urban stormwater as the biggest threat to the river's health. You may or may not recall that all seven council districts within the city of Mobile touch the Dog River watershed. We are 95 square miles, mostly inside the city limits. So I'm afraid, and it is with great, great regret, Dog River Clearwater Revival cannot support the passage of this as it is written because of some major key issues. And one of those is the adaptive reuse. The city of Mobile is an old city, as Mayor Stimson talked about earlier, we have got to get our arms around how this city has grown out and it's got so much grandfathered in, spot zoned, all of that. We have got to start somewhere in making those, uh, those parcels come into code. One of the biggest issues that we found was a lack of cross-referencing and we would be more than happy to continue to sit down I hope they don't mind still seeing me, to help you cross-reference. If in this building code, you are allowed to take an, uh, an acre of property and take it from woods to a parking lot, then in your design standards, either it needs to provide for litter capture or it needs to point you to the litter ordinance. The same thing is true with stormwater. Trees and landscaping are not aesthetic when it comes to Dog River Clearwater Revival. That is solely storm water. And there are ways to put trees, not doesn't have to be big trees. They, that's why we have the right tree, right place. This needs to go throughout the watershed. The conservation districts are marvelous. The riparian buffers, those things, we are thrilled about having maritime districts. Introducing these things are wonderful, but we need to go a step further and take this into the outreaches of the Dog River watershed. What happens if the headwaters affects the river? So by the time we catch it at the peninsula, it's too late. We need to start this at Schillinger Road. We need to start it at Spring Hill Avenue, all the way to Swede Town Road are our boundaries. We need your help. We, we love the start, we think it's great, but unless some of these things are changed, we cannot support it. I want to again, thank everyone for their, their work on this. This has been incredible. And just for your knowledge, Dog River Clearwater Revival and the city of Mobile was responsible for removing over 101,000 pounds of litter out of our watershed last year. We need help getting this out of off of the impervious surfaces before it goes into the drains. 
Thank you for helping us create a clean water future. We all work together. We look forward to sitting at the table with you as this continues on. Well, thank you for your comments. Mr. Chairman, I am admitting Erica Jones into the meeting. Ms. Jones, I don't know she's still connecting. Ms. Jones, can you hear us? Ms. Erica Jones? Yes. Yes, ma'am. You are now in the meeting. You may begin speaking. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. My name is Erica Jones of 1463 St. Stephen's Road in Mobile, Alabama. Um, I'm here to represent Sandtown, an area of Spring Hill dating back to the 1800s and historically comprised of persons of color, including former slaves, free blacks, and indigenous people. I'm a descendant and heir to the property, or some property in Sandtown, and a member of the Sandtown Community Action Group. This rustic area encompasses properties in and around Spring Hill Avenue, starting slightly east of what is now known as No Street and goes out as far west as Ziegler Boulevard. Southward, it extends to bump up against the Cedars um, and near the water tower or the old water tower. And it includes Monica Lane and Shipes Lane heading northward to its northernmost border of Three Mile Creek. That's the area that we're working to have acknowledged by the Historical Society as traditional Sandtown. Today, this area is more ethnically diverse. But at this time, the Sandtown Community Action Group would like to voice opposition to the Spring Hill Village Overlay Plans outlined in the UDC, since the village has previously pointed out that their organization is made up of only architects, developers, and the like. As residents and landowners, we do not feel inclusion is or has been shown to be advantageous to us necessarily. To that end, here are five points specifically under the UDC-4, which we'd like to take exception to. First, that area between Shifes Lane and Monica Lane, we'd like it to remain zoned as residential, as opposed to becoming an urban corridor as proposed by the Spring Hill Village. Secondly, the property located at 3767 Spring Hill Avenue was indicated as rezoned on the map or business or B2, as far back as 1971. But however, we know that the home that now sits on that property was not constructed until 1979 or 80. It is a single residence currently, and it states so in the mobile tax record, and we would like to see that it remains zoned as residential. Thirdly, Sandtown would like to remain under the city of Mobile's ordinances and codes, which requires a minimum of a six foot brick and mortar buffer between Sandtown homes and any commercial development. We oppose the Spring Hill Village minimum requirement that allows for shrubbery or a natural buffer of up to six feet between buildings. Fourth, on the UDC-4 map, it is indicated that some non-development lots in Sandtown will be addressed at a different time. These lots are currently labeled FLUM or F-L-U-M, indicating future land use, which was once referred to as parks and recreation. But we respectfully request that those locations be corrected on the map back to their current R1 zoning status, since they are labeled flown without prior notification to the families who still presently own those lots, specifically the ones numbered 1917180 and 435595. Finally, in the 1970s, funds exceeding $100,000 were marked community development for the Sandtown area and were approved but never applied to the community under a grant by Community Development Program and underwritten by Minority Business Development. The Sandtown Community Action Group would like to respectfully request a meeting with city officials in planning to discuss the accounting of past funds and or the reinstatement of comparable funding that would allow us to improve Sandtown, including a proposed through street extension of McGregor Avenue and the opposition to draconian building codes, among other issues. Thank you very much for your time and consideration today, but please keep in mind that we are not opposed to progress, but we would like to see how we can positively be impacted by the changes um, in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comments. How we can positively be impacted by the changes. 
Mr. Chairman, I'm admitting Elizabeth Stevens into the meeting. Ms. Stevens, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You may begin addressing the commission. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, Again, my name is Elizabeth Stevens, and I think I know most of you, but uh, for those who don't, I'm president of the Downtown Mobile Alliance. And uh, certainly let me start by saying, adding to the group of uh, congratulations to you all, members and staff, uh, for getting the zoning code uh, rewrite. Sorry, let me turn my video on. Um, maybe there's no video, okay. Um, to, for getting the zoning code uh, rewrite to this day, uh, it's, an, it's an important day, and I know it's been a, a multi-year and, and, and time-consuming effort, and I think we can all agree that our city's future is worth the effort, uh, and so thank you all, I, I, especially for the staff for undertaking this effort, and thank you to our mayor for supporting the staff through these years of efforts. I know many times the easier path would have been to just give up and do nothing, and, and we would we would not be better for that. So uh, my appreciation to you all for, for getting us to this day. Um, what you will be considering this spring is certainly not the end of the book, but a new chapter in the journey of planning and zoning for our 300 year old city. And that's certainly the way we look at it. And, and I imagine many on this call uh, who clearly care uh, uh, so much about our city uh, look at it as uh, a journey, as even as uh, Shayla and our mayor said. Uh, comments to the proposed changes to the DDD, which is Appendix A, have been submitted to the staff, and we look forward to getting together with them next week to discuss their responses. And I and I know y'all deal with a lot of big things, and these items may seem uh, small if if they get to you. But I always say a form-based code is all about the details. It is about details that make uh, downtown uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful place. Um, and as you hear and process information and comments from the many constituencies, I know I have absolute confidence as I think all of the speakers do that you uh, will do what's best for our city. Um, the people certainly spoke loudly and clearly in the map for mobile process and you know, they like all of us, they want a safe, beautiful and usable city in the Zoning code is a very crucial part, important part of re realizing such a city for her residents. So I just say thank you for your time and consideration and, and uh, certainly uh, wish you all the best in the, in, the, in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you for your, your comments. Mr. Chairman, I'm admitting Herbert Wagner into the meeting. Thank you. It's still connecting. Mr. Wagner, can you hear us? Yes, I'm sorry. Can That's you hear me? Right. Yes, sir. You're now in the meeting and may begin addressing the planning commission. Okay, thank you. Um, again, thank you for all the work that has been done. I have uh, been to many of the meetings from the very beginning uh, of this process. And um, I'm here to speak uh, in particular to the issues in Africa Town that have not been addressed um, as far as I know from uh, a letter I have received and messages from the people of Africa Town. And I want those uh, issues that they have raised. But it's a very active, very involved, engaged community. And we can all say that from, from day one, this is a community that has not received justice um, from the day they arrived and, and until today. Their issues have quite often been put to the side. They have been industrialized, they've been cut off from the rivers. And um, I would oppose any further. I think we need to be clear 
that this is the time if we're going to put this face on and we're going to say that we're supporting of Africa Town, it's time that we uh, also do that walk and protect Africa Town from any more encroachment of any form of industry. If you go there at 10 o'clock at night and you sit on uh, the porch, as I have done with friends, you hear heavy machinery. All day long, now you have the added uh, trucks coming uh, from Amazon, kicking up dust, putting out uh, fumes from their pipes. Another, a new uh, 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 detrimental uh, act against Africa Town's environment. And uh, I think it is time that we take seriously uh, uh, improving the lives. And, you know, as long as I have been involved with these issues for eight, nine years now, it seems like two, three times a year, there's another challenge to the integrity of the environment of the people who live in Africa Town. Whether it's noise pollution, whether it's uh, undrafted fumes from uh, storage tanks, and of course the new issue of coal dust. Um, and uh, I, I just, I find it appalling that we continue to call upon those people who benefit the least from all of these improvements. Um, I think it's uh, embarrassing that they, they must suffer the most and benefit the least. And I think it's time to listen to them and put aside whatever we would sort of care for and, um, and abide by what they believe that they need for their community to grow because I believe that our future is tied with the history of Africa Town. And if people come to Mobile to see Africa Town and what they see is industry and what they hear is uh, uh, industrial equipment, uh, I don't know how likely they are to encourage their friends to come down um, and, and visit the center. And I want it to be a beautiful, welcoming, serene place as it should be. Um, these fumes that uh, cross into these neighborhoods, I like to call it a toxic trespass. Uh, these are toxic fumes. They cause everything from asthma to COPD to birth defects to mental illness. They're like drugs, basically fumes off of, from industry do the same thing that illicit drugs do. They affect someone's health. They affect someone's ability to learn. They affect someone's ability to function. And, um, and it's time that we pay uh, attention. And I, I know some people will speak after I, uh, and they will address more specifically those issues. But I just wanted to speak out um, just in the term of social justice, environmental justice, and justice for the people of Africa Town. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Who we have next? Mr. Chairman, I'm admitting Joe Womack into the meeting. Mr. Womack, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. You may begin addressing the Planning Commission. Okay, thank you. I'm a retired Marine Major, uh, Joe Womack. Mr. Chairman, I'm and I'm, Joe excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm retired Marine Major, Joe Womack, uh, Africatown uh, native. And I want to uh, remind uh, some of you and, and maybe even inform some of you for the first time that our sister city up the road, Montgomery, made over a billion, that's B, billion with a B, over a billion dollars during the first 12 months that the E.J. Lynching Museum was open. Right now, I understand from my friends up in Montgomery that the city councilmen are fighting over how to spend that money, and they're already advertising in anticipation of COVID diminishing uh, the end of this year. So they can't wait to get back in there. And we've been told by the people in the Alabama Historical Commission that, that we've got a better prize. The, the community of Africa Town got a better story. We got the community, 
We got the people, we got the descendants, we got the school, we got everything still there. And if it's done right, we can top Montgomery. We we gonna we're gonna tell Montgomery that uh, we're gonna top what they did once we get open it and do it right. But it has to be done right. It has to be a total collaboration between the African town community, the city of Mobile, and Mobile County. If those three organizations hold hand and ride together, we can make over a billion dollars for the city in less than 12 months if it's done right. But there are some things with the uh, UDC code that uh, we, we have to keep in mind in that Africa town is different than most than all other communities in Mobile. It's the only community that's surrounded by 17 industries. And you can't make a code with one size fits all. You have to identify the, the, the differences and be more specific in the coding. For instance, let's talk about the big thing that we've been talking about for years, storage tanks. If you look at the wording for, for the, uh, for the uh, buffer zone and storage tanks, it says 15, in, in Africa town, you can't put up a storage tank within 1800 feet of the Africa town historic district. We have to look at that wording. You have the Africa town community, which is 5,500, which is uh, five square miles, you have the Africa Town Historic District, which is located inside community of two square miles. So you could actually put storage tanks in Happy Hills and not bother the Africa Town Historic Community, um, Historic District, but you're still in the Africa Town uh, Community. And the Happy Hills area, according to our plans for the community, is a is a big issue, a big issue of what we're trying to do. Our goal is to change the African town community into an African-American historical cultural destination. A destination is a place where you go and take your family. You go for weddings like Las Vegas. You go for, for conventions. You, you, you go for, for, for the scenery. And that's one thing we're working on is scenery. And, 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 and with the governor bringing $35 million in here to improve the Brooklyn field, area for, for, for uh, family activities, Africa Town is the hook for Mobile. I want you to listen to this now. Africa Town is the hook. It's like when you put out a movie, they put out a trailer. And that trailer, they show all on the TV over and over until you say, I got to go see that movie. Africa Town is the hook. It's what's going to bring people down to Brooklyn Field. It's gonna, what's going to bring people down to the Gulf Quest. It's what's going to bring people down to the convention center. And, and, and it's going to bring people down to Mobile to eat dinner and, and, and stay in a hotel. And that'll push that revenue up for the city of Mobile. Africatown don't have no hotel. The people have to stay in Mobile to come to Africatown. But it's the hook to get them there. And you got to make sure that this hook is done right. Got to be a total collaboration between the city, the county, and the community. And you can't have storage tanks anywhere around Africa Town, nowhere. Those stories, the, the, the safety buffer should be at least 2,000 feet from the community, not just for the historical district, but the community. Concerning mis, mixed use zoning, I know Africa Town is, is a food desert, but no one wants to wake up in the morning and, and find out that you, the area next to them been switched to a mixed use zoning. The key to having successful uh, uh, grocery stores and stuff, stuff in Africa Town are the people. Right now, Africa Town has less than 2,000 people. At one time, we were up to 10, 12,000. We had all sorts of grocery stores in there. You got to get the people into the community first, and then you put up the businesses. Then you put up the 7-Eleven, the Dollar Tree, the Dollar, Dollar General, but you got to get the people in there first. And so you can't change, you shouldn't change in the residential areas until you get the people there. Because right now, the community has houses that need to be fixed up for people. It has vacant lots, and Mr. we should Walmart. be changing those vacant lots over. So, Mr. so we've got Mr. Walmart. 
Would you please start wrapping up your comments? We reached your five minute mark. Thank you. Yeah, so so we got to remember that Africa Town is 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 different than other communities, and we got to preserve and save it because there's no other place. And I'm 70 years old in Mobile that I know of that has ever brought in a billion dollars for the city, and we think we can do it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your comments. <clears throat> Who's next to speak? Mr. Chairman, I'm admitted, admitting Judy Adams into the meeting. She's still connecting to audio. Ms. Adams, can you hear us? Ms. Adams, can you hear the meeting? Hello. Ms. Adams, you're in the Planning Commission meeting. You can begin addressing the commission now. Can you hear me? Yes. Ms. Adams, you put your cell phone mute. Hear me now. Yes, ma'am. You can begin addressing the commission now. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. I am Judith Adams. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for the Alabama State Port Authority. Ms. Adams? Hear me now. Yes, ma'am, and you need to turn your live stream off. I see it. Thank you. How about this? Is this better? Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Judith Adams. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for the Alabama State Port Authority. We want to thank the City of Mobile and the Planning Commission for the opportunity to provide these public remarks on the proposed Unified Development Code. On behalf of our management team, the Port Authority has valued and appreciate, appreciated the City's efforts to address the Port's comments and concerns as MAP has moved through its process. The Port Authority engaged in this process despite its statutory exemption to help educate city staff and consultants on both the regulatory structures and the functional and flexible land use is critical to a dynamic and competitive seaport. As a significant e economic driver to the region, the public and private cargo vessel activities at the Port of Mobile locally account for close to 50,000 jobs and those jobs in turn generate about 822 million in local purchases. Local business revenues total 3.28 billion. A vast majority of our comments were heard and addressed. We thank you for that collaboration and partnership. We also applaud the city's informational sessions and public commitment to this living document. As the city staff had relayed, version four will remain a living document following adoption. The intent is to have a plan that could be amended to foster growth, job creation, address market changes, and in the case of the seaport, address changes to shipping and logistics. We have long stated that shipping and cargo handling and infrastructure concepts of 40 years ago do not come close to the realities of today. The ships are bigger, 
cargo handling is more sophisticated, the port cargo base has diversified, and our region's economy has grown and diversified. Restrictions today may very well be prohibitive to future market and economic needs. This is the importance of the living document. Just a few examples of issues that can be addressed after adoption. The UDC proposes a 100-foot height uh, limitation in the port rather than the 200-foot height right in the heavy maritime zones. But the heavy maritime zones do not exist as of yet. The vast majority of the working port is I-2. So why is this important? Cranes, maritime buildings, and other vertical structures in the port exceed 100 feet. Under the current 100-foot restriction, Austell, MTC Logistics, and our super post Panamax cranes would not be allowed. Another issue we hope to reassess in the future pertains to the 1,500-foot setback for temporary tanks. These are often called frack tanks, and they look like a container being pulled behind a 18-wheeler, but they're designed to hold liquid. For our shipyards and regulated oily waste contractors, these are used to hold removed fuel from vessels that have to undergo repair or refurbishment or to remove federally regulated oily waste that is common in all commercial vessels. These tanks also hold byproducts stemming from the clean out and maintenance of tanks, vessels, and barges. And temporary tanks are used in environmental remediation, and they are also used in hydrostatic testing. These applications, for instance, are used by MAWS and all of their pipeline projects. All of these applications would handle hazardous materials. With this said, we still support MAP for Mobile, the process, and we urge adoption. The Alabama State Port Authority is a committed resource to the city. We look forward to continued collaboration post-adoption to ensure through this living document that our maritime industries and our port city's economy continue to flourish. And I thank you for your time today. Ms. Chairman, I have admitted Lella Lowe into the meeting. Ms. Lowe, can you hear us? I can. I can. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You may begin addressing the Planning Commission now. Okay, great. Thank you for letting me talk to you. My name is Lella Lowe. I live at 2609 Shea Court in District 6. Uh, I've participated in the UDC process since the beginning and uh, joining in the various meetings with Matt Bo for Mobile to brainstorm what we want our city to look like and to be like. And I've submitted numerous written comments over the years, uh, the latest being offered uh, with this latest version, and then I submitted comments to you all. So my written comments have generally focused on Africatown and the environment, but why, you may wonder, does an older white woman in West Mobile care about Africatown? You, you may have, you have my specific comments in written form, so I really want to address the why of that today. It is often said that a budget is a moral document because where your money goes is where your priorities lie. And on a personal level, if you ask someone to see their checkbook, you can see where their priorities lie by what they spend money on. So uh, similarly, I feel that a municipality's zoning laws are a moral document indicating how you are protecting and, and assuring uh, the security, the quality of life for all citizens. And so given that understanding, I've been playing a little scenario around in my head. As we continue to make plans for Africatown as an African-American cultural heritage site and destination, you just listened to Joe Womack's plans for uh, it being a destination. I'm imagining that perhaps the tours that you're taking on will take you past the industrial area surrounding this 150 year old community. 
And that would demonstrate right now environmental injustice in action. Because imagine that tour going past a home in Africa town that backs up to a simple chain link fence that is the sole barrier between a person's residence and an industrial site where trucks travel in and out all day long over a dusty dirt road, creating dust and debris that falls on top of the homes in this historic area. And it's kind of reminiscent of the industrial pollution that fell on their homes for decades from the paper companies. The tour guides that also point to where looming petrochemical storage tanks threaten to overwhelm the neighboring residential areas. The chemical plants that still to this day emit noxious odors and the interstate connector that effectively cut the community in two a couple of decades ago, virtually destroying the small businesses that sustained the neighborhood. Okay, now reimagine that there are 10 foot tall concrete barriers between those same uh, two zoned areas, a residential and an industrial zone, and that there are odor abatement requirements such that as nuisance vapor capture, where the tour guide can demonstrate the efforts made by the new zoning code to prevent particulate odor and noise pollution. Now imagine generous riparian buffers established along unused industrial waterfront to help beautify this neglected historic area. And imagine that tour guides can explain that the new zoning code adopted into law allows for unused industrial areas to be downzoned because of the city's commitment to revitalizing this important historic community. Now imagine in being able to point to protections that are in place to maintain this significant neighborhood as a treasure for all tourists to appreciate, especially celebrating the efforts made to acknowledge and mourn that historic legacy while making zoning laws that improve the site to represent the city's commitment to environmental justice. That's what can be done by enhancing the Africatown overlay to truly protect and preserve the Africatown community. So for someone like me, it comes down to the moral issue of justice for all citizens. I've been a member of the Mobile Environmental Justice Action Coalition for seven years, and I've met with and learned from and become friends with residents of Africatown. So I've interacted with them on a regular basis during that time. Me, Jack, and NAACP hosted a wonderful webinar series last week on issues that can be addressed by the zoning code. I listened to Africatown residents and stakeholders explain their experiences having lived in surround, living surrounded by industry. And I appreciated that this is their experience, not mine, it's theirs, but I listened. And I hope that you will listen to and ensure that this new zoning code is truly a moral document that makes justice happen for all Mobile residents. Thank you. I've interacted with them on a regular basis. Okay. Uh, Ms. Pappas, I got your message. Wonderful webinar series. Yes, thank you. I've just admitted Linda Gates into the meeting. Ms. Gates, if you could please cut the live stream. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Yes, ma'am, and we can hear you. Uh, you may begin addressing the Planning Commission, please. Okay, my name is Linda Gates. I live at 4154 Ursuline Drive, and my family also owns property at 4464 Oshell Road and 4505 Oshell Road. Um, I know that there are other property owners um, in the Spring Hill area who would have participated in this meeting, but they just weren't comfortable with the virtual format. And as I've watched it, <clears throat> It's very arduous for you to do this every week. Thank you for, or every, however often you do it, thank you for doing it. What I'm about to say, I've said or written many times since 2008 when the blueprint for Spring Hill was debated. And some of you were involved in that uh, process. The main point of my past comments has been what is referred and uh, the main point of my past comments has been what is now referred to as the Spring Hill overlay should not be mandatory as is proposed in the current document. <clears throat> A response to this comment was received from the city after the third rewrite and reads as follows. 
comments on previous versions requested that the standards be mandatory and the proposal is in response to prior requests. Well, I know that on each version, there's also been requests that the standards remain optional as was decided and adopted in 2008. <clears throat> and my request has been among those. The basic issue is that the Village of Spring Hill group, which has done some really good things for our city, is advocating that the properties that lie within the boundaries set by the village of Spring Hill should not be developed in the same manner as the rest of the city. That Spring Hill should have special zoning. Section 6413-2A3 of the proposed UDC reads as follows. Properties being developed or redeveloped within the Spring Hill overlay shall comply with all applicable regulations of this article. And after listening to the list of um, requests from other people, I only have one, and that's to just change that word shall to may. The mandatory application of these strict standards to me seems to be in conflict with the map for Mobile on page 70 of the map for mobile documents, it stated, while form-based codes don't work especially well in areas that are, you know, while form-based codes work especially well in areas that are being newly, newly developed, hybrid codes tend to be more effective for places that are already largely developed. Spring Hill overlay is a strict form-based code and Spring Hill is largely already developed. The issue of making these standards mandatory came up with the map for Mobile in 2015. The document was adopted with the mandatory language removed. It was the same for the blueprint for Spring Hill in 2008, mandatory language removed. The same for the smart growth for Mobile in 2004, mandatory language removed. And I think the present precedent has been set by these previous decisions to keep the standards optional. Our Spring Hill community was deeply divided in 2008 over this issue, and it does not need to happen again. Allowing application of the standards that do not apply to the rest of the city, but making them mandatory for Spring Hill, will, but, but not making them mandatory for Spring Hill will alleviate the divisive issue. The people leading the effort for the mandatory application of the spring overlay do not own property that's affected by the mandatory language. If a property owner does have property that is affected and wants to develop the property according to the overlay regulations, that person can do that even now. Um, Victor Dover, his team developed the blueprint for Spring Hill, stated in 2008 that there was no reason for the standards to be mandatory. He felt there was no need because once developers begin using the standards, they will be accepted without issue. So we don't need this controversy. We made a decision in 2008 to make it optional. All sides agreed. And at every juncture, someone has tried to make it mandatory. So I'm gonna ask you just change that one word from shall to may, and I think we'll be, be okay with it. So um, thank you to the staff. I know they've worked really hard just listening to the previous comments and I'm happy, and I, I know from trying to read our zoning um, in 2008, and now reading this zoning, this is a lot better. The UDC is a lot better, but I'm just asking that we not have mandatory application of the Spring Hill overlay. Thank you for your time.
Thank you for your comments. Um, who do we have next? Mr. Chairman, I'm admitting Matt White into the meeting. He is currently connecting to audio. The mandatory appreciated. Are you doing my administration, possibly other Okay, Matt? Yes. Please cure, uh, please cease your live stream. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And you may begin addressing the planning commission now. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the planning commission. Uh, I wish to speak on behalf of myself. I am a principal at White Spunner Realty. We're a local uh, commercial property developer and property manager. Uh, I'd like to speak, uh, I guess, mostly to the, uh, the process that we engaged with with the city when we first became aware of this uh, Uniform Development Code initiative. Uh, we first read the initiative in-house. Uh, we then hired a local land planning firm to go through that in relation to the properties that we manage and are undeveloped as well. Uh, we then came up with a list of concerns and went and visited with Ms. Uh, Biko and her team. The, we feel like our concerns were uh, uh, well received and uh, largely incorporated in, uh, along with other collective concerns with the initial um, uh, code that came out in 2017. We are at this point satisfied with, with what we see along with our civil engineering firm that we did engage. Uh, we appreciate Ms. Pico and her staff um, hearing us out uh, from our development developer perspective. I guess most expressively, we, we appreciate uh, hearing us out on neutralizing the up zoning or down zoning of property here in the, uh, the city of, of Mobile. So that was a heavy lift, uh, a large consideration on their part in our view. And so we really appreciate the neutralization of, of that initiative. And we appreciate the process that you know, have to go through to, to up zone or down zone your, your property. So uh, with that said, I think our overall feeling uh, within our, our collective group is that uh, we appreciate the time and effort that the city has gone to to improve the process. It, it was not an ideal process before or currently. And so we appreciate the efforts that they've gone to we, we in, uh, by and large, feel that this is an improvement and we're in full support of the initiative and the mayor and his staff. That concludes my comments. Thank you, sir, for those comments. Who do we have next? Mr. Chairman, I'm admitting Dr. Phil Butera into the meeting. He is currently connecting to audio. Dr. Butera, can you hear us? Dr. Butera, you're on mute. Dr. Butera, you are muted. Okay, can you, could you please speak now? We should be able to hear you.
Dr. B. Tara, can you hear us? Dr. Butera, if you can hear us, I'm going to lead you into the in the meeting and admit the next speaker. Okay, Ramsey Spread, I've admitted you into the meeting. Meeting, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. If you would like, please go ahead and begin addressing the planning commission. Great. Good afternoon. I'm Ramsey Sprague. I reside at 63 South Fulton Street near Murphy. I speak as president of the Mobile Environmental Justice Action Coalition. MEDAC, as it is called, was founded by Africatown residents in 2013 in partnership with regional advocates to address environmental racism throughout Mobile. I'm also speaking today for the Mobile Alabama NAACP President Robert Clopton, its Executive Committee, and its Environmental and Climate Justice Committee for which I also serve as chair. Environmental racism is an everyday occurrence in Mobile. The pursuit of environmental justice requires the meaningful and informed participation of residents, decision makers, as well as subject matter experts to find just solutions to challenges caused by the zoning sins of the past that must not be repeated in the future. Our agencies were initially excited to help inform and update to the zoning code, but we have serious reservations with elements of its public participation process, as well as its timidity. Now, the UDC's neighborhood meeting standards are thoroughly reasonable. We are encouraged by the creation of the UDC's low impact development and riparian buffer standards, as well as the fact of the creation of the Africatown overlay itself. Unfortunately, the Africatown overlay and other elements fall short of our expectations and in some cases offend the sensibilities of our organization and partners. For instance, the city de declined to respond in writing about any concerns raised about the Africatown overlay, but not so with other overlay districts. Over the last two years at every public participation opportunity regarding the Africatown overlay and industrial zoning standards, we have been uh, generally saying that one, we see glaring missed opportunities in the overlay. Like the village of Spring Hill overlay, which is more than 10 times longer than Africatown's, the Africatown overlay ought to address purpose and intent, which must include abatement of industrial blight and promotion of residential cohesion through harmony with its future non-residential zones neighbors. Future non-residential development must reinforce Africatown's residential heritage and its integrity. Two, the Africatown overlay, which is surrounded by water on three sides, doesn't include any provision for waterfront conservation, despite the city ostensibly supporting two water-based heritage tourism efforts in Africatown. The proposed water-dependent maritime use exemption to all riparian buffer standards is too broad. If unchanged, effectively, all of Africatown's waterfront will be exempt from potential waterfront conservation standards in future development along Three Mile Creek, the Mobile River, Chickasaw Creek, and Hog Bayou, and that would be a crime against Africatown's future. Three, the Africatown overlay must prohibit new non-replacement above ground oil and hazardous storage tank creation in Africatown. If we all agree we should be past the petrochemical tank farm expansion episode, then please, let's be past it. Four, Due to its controversial nature, the coal handling operation ordinance should have been developed through a separate ordinance adoption process altogether and not as part of the Map for Mobile UDC process. Unlike protection for Africatown, the Map for Mobile saw nobody clamoring to expand dirty coal export in city zoning jurisdiction. Five, protection buffers are defined in code as being intended to quote, physically separate unlike uses and minimize light debris and visual intrusion onto adjacent lots. With sometimes truly horrifying results, these goals are not accomplished by current protection buffer standards, which are more or less being carried over intact into the UDC. The harrowing lessons afforded by Chin Street residents in Africatown's Magazine Point neighborhood must be respected. The halting of private outdoor residential activity due to debris intrusion could be and should be functionally minimized by protection buffer standards designed to do what they are already defined to do, be able to do in law. 
The UDC's protection buffer standards for industrial and maritime zones that border residential zones are simply too weak for vulnerable neighborhoods in Mobile like Africa Town, among others. And finally, six. In 2017, in its current assessment of fair housing report to HUD, the city declared its intent to accommodate and encourage access to innovative affordable housing, then via the then anticipated zoning code revisions. But today's proposed UDC standards are very often divergent from too many of the AFH reports' metrics. Assertions to HUD about federal dollars designated for affordable housing efforts in such reports are generally considered binding and transparency around the lack of alignment between the UDC and the AFH is warranted in the least. In conclusion, the pandemic may have complicated every aspect of life, but the urgency of environmental justice in Mobile has not diminished. Thank you for your time and careful consideration of our agency's spoken and written comments for today's hearing and all the work that's gone into the UDC so far. Thank you for your comments. Dr. Tara, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can. Great. Uh, if you would, please go and begin. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I am Dr. Philip Butera from the Coalition for Intelligent Economic Growth. Throughout the UDC development process, our group has made recommendations that attempt to eliminate the source of multiple past conflicts between residential areas and the business community throughout our city, while not imposing undue burdens on business development. The proposed UDC uh, is, uh, says that when assessing issues of rezoning, conditional use, or planned developments, the reviewing body must take into account whether the development is compatible with and does not have an adverse impact on neighborhoods or create a loss of property values. Using these same criteria as a guide, our recommendations are as follows. First, almost all our residential communities are bordered by B2 and B3 commercial zones. B2 and B3 businesses such as nightclubs and waste management facilities currently allowed by right in these zones should not be allowed to share a lot line with a residential area. This concern has been echoed by multiple citizen groups throughout the city. The activities and hours of operation of these businesses are not compatible with residential neighborhoods. To comply with the proposed UDC criteria, we first recommended the creation of a new business light zone for these areas, allowing only more compatible businesses to share lot lines with residential areas. And we included a list of those compatible businesses with our recommendation. When rejected, we submitted an alternative recommendation that included a mandatory minimum distance separating lots of these B2 and B3 businesses from neighborhood lots. This feature is already utilized in dealing with adult entertainment establishments. Even the required 10 foot protection buffer as written provides insufficient separation for the purpose. Neither of these recommendations are included in the current UDC. Either of these solutions could be phased in at the time of lease turnover or lot sale with minimal disruption. We believe that these recommendations focusing on business and residential properties with the shared lot line will profoundly decrease the number of conflicts between businesses and residential communities. It should also significantly decrease the frequency of residential neighborhood decline that subsequently follows inappropriate shared lot lines. It should also provide some security for residents who invest in home ownership within the city limits. Second, since much of Mobile has already been developed, to be successful, the UDC plan must not only address new development projects, 
but also bring existing developments up to code requirements over time. The new UDC code requires a 50% expansion of previously developed commercial property to trigger landscape upgrading. Realistically, this cannot happen on the footprint of most existing commercial developments. We recommended landscape upgrading at the time of resurfacing parking lots or when a sale or a lease, a new lease of property involving a minimum of 8,000 square feet is negotiated. This too was not included in the UDC. My final point addresses the process of dealing with zoning changes, conditional uses and planned developments and the application of develop uh, for development section. The petitioner is required to have a neighborhood meeting and to summarize the minutes of that meeting, a most unusual requirement given the petitioner's position. The meeting should not only allow the opportunity to discuss different perspectives on the project, but also have it fairly documented without bias. Therefore, we recommended that a neighborhood representative review the minutes and either sign off on the document or make corrections or comments before the document is submitted. This can be done expeditiously by providing this final document to members of the reviewing body one week before the issue comes before them. Members will have the time to review and discuss the data at their convenience. In all likelihood, this process should significantly shorten the time devoted to presentations on the issue at hearings of the commission or the council. It should also facilitate a more expedited decision rather than having the issue tabled to subsequent meetings for additional interim study. This too was not included in the proposed UDC. We do hope that you will seriously consider adding these recommendations to the proposed UDC. And we thank you for the opportunity to present them to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Who's next? Mr. Chairman, Richard Weevil is now in the meeting. Mr. Weevil, can you hear us? You're on mute. How about now? That's fine. You may address the commission. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and commission, my name is Richard Weevil. I live at 1700 Government Street and have for 40 years. I'm with the Weevil Company. We have been in the commercial and industrial real estate development for 45 years. And we have worked with the city through the years by serving on numerous committees to streamline the development process, to take care of trees, have proper signage, and be very sensitive to the environment. Uh, can I go on without at least thanking um, Shayla and her team and the mayor for the significant amount of work that they have put into this UDC? I know this process began, what, maybe three years ago um, uh, with a document that we felt would slow the process of development and also drive up the cost severely, which means you would not be able to rent your buildings um, you would not be able to meet the market demands and therefore nothing new would be developed, which is exactly what we do not need in an area that's fighting for growth. The process of working together has produced a document that we believe is easier to maneuver, uh, can find what you're looking for, and with the present modifications, it is something that our industry believes that we can live with. The city has made a gallant effort to try and balance this document among development groups, neighborhood groups, and environmental groups. And obviously they have done a pretty good job because no one is completely happy. But again, I say I believe that this is a document that we can live with, and I hope that the commission will adopt this without any changes. 
I want to thank you for allowing me to speak on what we consider an extremely important change to our city code. The last thing in the world any of us want is to stifle development in our community. So I'd like to thank you for uh, your time today and allowing me to speak. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Um, who do we have next? Development groups, neighborhood groups. Uh, I've admitted Robert Clopton into the meeting. Mr. Clopton, I'm going to unmute you and you will need to terminate the live stream. Okay, you will need to unmute on your end, please, sir. Thank you. You can now address the commission. Good afternoon. To the City of Mobile Planning Commission, I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity. I'm Robert Clopton, president of the Mobile NAACP. I reside in District 6, 2612 Charlotte Oaks Drive. Again, I want to thank you for this opportunity to comment, to comment on this most important project that you have tirelessly engaged. I must first recognize Mr. Sprague. Mr. Womack and Mr. Lowe for basically reviewing everything I want to talk about today. The mission of the NAACP is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights for all people and eliminate race-based discrimination. As you can see, our goals and yours are similar. And together, our goals are to accomplish something incredible, building a mobile, a mobile that works for all, not just a privileged few. Now, personally, I salute you, not merely because of what you have done and hopefully it was filled with creative purpose, a calm dignity, determined courage, but also meaningful fulfillment for justice for all people. However, as I commend you, we also acknowledge perceived shortcomings in this more thorough report that does not address our four constituents are constituencies that I address, political education, social and economic equality of rights. Your aims have been noble and your ideas, your dedication. It's been inspiring as we have watched as you have review, written, reviewed, revisited, acknowledged, changed and improved through your process. So your achievements are somewhat amazing for the proposed project. Your work, hey, overall, it has served as a beacon of light and shows some hope. But does it address those that are left in the seas, the stormy seas of oppression? Someday, someday, probably long after we all are gone, Citizen Mobile will look back in pride in the achievements that can be made if it's all inclusive, that it addresses the needs of all communities. Let's, let's look at Africa Town. We've heard numerous, numerous comments and reports about Africa Town. I want to look at one issue that is from the environmental standpoint. We feel there are niche issues that really need to be addressed. These issues on this most historic area causes environmental shortcomings through industry and potentially dangerous poisons to the environment and the individuals, thus compromising their health their health. Healthcare is very important. 
We don't fear that the citizens in most areas have been assured a quality, unpausing atmosphere from debris, dust, noise, and soil contamination. From an economic development standpoint, it has already been addressed, I believe, by Ms. Womack, so I won't dwell into that at all. But as the young lady said from the beginning, this is a giant step forward. And the mayor said it's a framework to address change without the baggage that was previously attached to the UDC. But however, if the health, safety, welfare, economic, educational, and all aspects of justice and not address for all people, then there is a problem. Again, and that's where the NAACP comes in. Again, all we want is to ensure the political, education, social, and economic equality of rights of all people and to eliminate race-based discrimination. And I will close with something that Dr. King said, because the one issue I looked at was environmental and we feel it's an injustice but as Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. He went on to say, we are all caught up in an, in an inescapable network, a network, a network. We are tied into a single garment of destiny, whatever affects anyone directly will ultimately affect us all indirectly, indirectly. I want to thank you for your time, your work, your efforts. Again, as I said earlier, it goes beyond reproach. But however, justice for everyone must be taken under consideration. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Margaret, who do we have next? Is there an issue or something? Hello? Hello? Hey, Steve, I can hear you. You can hear me? Good. Just one second. I don't hear from the staff. I think, I don't know if they're having a technical issue or what. We can't hear you, Margaret, staff. Hey, Steve, turn off your live stream. Can you hear staff now? Yes, we hear you can. now. Okay. Mr. Gordon, are, are, is your audio good on your end? Yes, I hear you fine. Okay, you may begin addressing the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Uh, I'm Steve Gordon. And I'll be speaking. Can you hear staff now? Yes, hear you now. Mr. Gordon, turn off your live stream. Whatever device you're listening to it on, turn it off, please. Okay, Mr. Gordon, you're muted.
Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Steve Gordon, and I'll be speaking on behalf of Keep Mobile Growing. I'm the current president. Keep Mobile Growing is a nonprofit alliance made up of over 100 port related businesses and industries that aid in the generation of over $21.7 billion annually and contribute 147,000 jobs in the Mobile area and Alabama economy. Keep Mobile Growing recognizes the critical need to modernize and update Mobile's antiquated zoning ordinance and truly appreciates the consideration, considerable amount of time and effort devoted to this by the city of Mobile staff. Understanding that the city needs feedback from all of the various stakeholders impacted in order to arrive at a well-balanced, updated code, the KMG leadership has been engaged throughout the many years long process, and we have met with city officials and staff, provided comments to each of the four variations of the draft ordinances, testified at planning commission and city council meetings, kept in regular contact with the staff, engaged in the spirit of compromise, kept our membership informed and made the draft or zoning ordinance a substantial part of our program at our last two annual meetings. We believe significant progress has been made over the painstaking process of preparing four versions of the code, eliminating a number of the issues and problem areas that would cripple the competitiveness of our businesses and industry, while still meeting the intent of these important updates. We have submitted written comments concerning some minor tweaks that we believe would improve and make this a strong ordinance to the benefit of all stakeholders in the city of Mobile. We want to be clear that we support this ordinance and the updating of the Mobile Antiquated Zoning Code. We thank you for your consideration and time and a attention to this important matter and for the ability of Keep Mobile growing, growing to provide input that will strengthen the proposal, proposed ordinance. Thank you for your time this afternoon and we look forward to moving forward. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'm yes. admitting I'm admitting Ms. Teresa Tessner into the meeting. Ms. Tessner, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You may begin addressing the Planning Commission. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Teresa Tessner. I live at 272 Park Terrace in the Linekoff Historic District, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Mobile Tree Commission. The Tree Commission does not have authority over private trees, but our enabling legislation does charge us with fostering the planting, growth, and protection of trees on private property. And it is in that capacity that I'm speaking today. The landscaping and tree requirements of the UDC represent a powerful opportunity to strengthen and expand the tree infrastructure of Mobile now and into the future. With that in mind, we would respectfully ask that the UDC be revised in the following ways prior to recommendation for approval. First, there are no landscaping and tree requirements for single and two family residential parcels. Yet development of this type does result in the loss of pervious area at a minimum and may also result in loss of tree cover. I've seen no justification for the continued exemption of one and two family parcels that would outweigh the public good derived from including some minimum amount of green space and tree planting on these parcels. Second, the UDC basically reduces the tree requirement for frontage and perimeter trees from one tree every 30 feet to one every 50 feet. This represents a significant reduction in potential tree canopy. 
The justification for reducing the minimum number of trees required is that it promotes the proper spacing for best tree growth. However, many of the trees in the approved plant list have a mature canopy well under 50 feet. The, D the UDC should be modified to require a minimum of one overstory tree per 30 feet unless the planting requirements for the tree state a larger spacing distance. This would allow trees to be planted at distances that will promote their optimum growth while allowing more density in those instances where trees with smaller distancing requirements are used. Third, the UDC should be modified to state that heritage tree removal on any site shall not be allowed without demonstration that the development plan cannot be designed to accommodate the heritage trees on the site. This should include language that allows certain automatic or administrative reductions or revisions of setbacks and offsets, required parking spaces, driveway placement and materials, et cetera, to accommodate the retention of heritage trees. For example, Orange Beaches Code includes administrative waiver or reduction of certain setbacks in order to preserve a heritage tree and a schedule for reducing required parking spaces when doing so would preserve 12 inch DBH or greater protected trees in conflict with the parking requirement. Fourth, it is not clear whether the UDC incorporates a mechanism to verify the accuracy of the site plan with regard to existing trees and tree protections or that development is proceeding in accordance with the landscape plan. Toward that end, Article 10, Section F of the proposed code should be expanded to require the tree and landscape plans to indicate the location, species, and size of existing trees with a DBH of three inches or more, whether they are planned for preservation or not, show the location, species, and size of all off-site heritage trees within 25 feet of proposed construction and earthwork, show the critical root zone for on-site preserved trees and off-site heritage trees within 25 feet of proposed construction and earthwork, and be prepared and certified by either a licensed arborist, licensed landscape architect, or certified landscape professional if the work will require any tree removal. Furthermore, the permitting process for any building, construction, or land clearing should require site inspection by an arborist or equally qualified inspector from the city prior to any groundbreaking or removal of vegetation to make sure the landscape plan is complete and accurate and that required tree protections are in place prior to the start of work. In my remaining time, I would like to add this comment from the Government Street Collaborative, which could not speak today. The collaborative requests that staff revisit the following two issues of continued citizen concern that impact quality of life, health, and safety. First, the green space tree and landscaping reductions, which have the potential to increase stormwater runoff and heat. And second, the negative infrastructure pressures of the proposed density slash occupancy standards in all urban residential developments. Thank you for this opportunity to give input today on this very important step forward in Mobile's progress. For your comments. Mr. Chairman, I've admitted Terry Harbin into the meeting. Mr. Harbin, can you hear us? I can, thank you, Margaret. Yes, please begin addressing the commission. Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. As Margaret mentioned, my name is Terry Harbin. Um, many of you will know uh, me as a banker for many years in Mobile. Uh, most recently, I retired from that and begun a new venture called Affordable Homes Gulf Coast, which is focused on providing affordable housing uh, for low to moderate income uh, families in low to moderate income census tracts primarily. And I also address you today as the current chairman of the board of directors for the Mobile Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I'll be brief. Uh, but also want to thank you for all of your efforts. I know that Shayla and her team have worked very hard in the community meetings to be inclusive. I think I've attended three of those meetings over the maybe the last couple of years. Um, and in terms of the 
chamber representation, uh, the chamber continues to support the effort uh, to both modernize and update the city's zoning and development regulations. Uh, we believe the city has made significant progress over the four uh, prior versions and eliminating issues and, and problem areas for uh, business and industry. And uh, we applaud the progress that has been made. Uh, I can tell you over my years as, as a banker, I listened to many business owners when we were working to finance projects, both local and existing business owners and folks coming in from out of town. And, you know, singularly their desire was uh, to have certainty, clarity, a firm footing on what the zoning ordinance were uh, in Mobile and, and uh, the standards that they needed to meet to uh, make sound investment decisions within the community. So certainly important from an economic development standpoint. Today, as I put on this new hat with Affordable uh, Homes Gulf Coast, uh, working to address the, the needs of affordable housing in Mobile, uh, the same issues apply, you know, modernized uh, UDC will help us uh, really ensure our developments um, reflect the appropriate characteristics of the various distinct uh, areas that will be in throughout the city and uh, the certainty it uh, provides uh, will also uh, help us feel good about our investment decisions. Uh, I think broadly as we uh, work to make Mobile uh, competitive uh, with other areas uh, and folks that are looking to relocate or or just wanting to return to Mobile, uh, quality of life is a big, big concern, a big issue. And I think uh, the efforts uh, placed into the, the new and updated UDC are reflective of that. Uh, I've listened to a number of the, the previous uh, commenters. And so I'll, I'll just acknowledge that uh, anything new is not perfect. Uh, but I think uh, speaking as a former banker, as a leader of the chamber, uh, and as a personal developer, I uh, think this goes a long, long way in the right direction. Uh, so I think uh, we're very, very supportive of the updated and modernized uh, UDC. And I, again, just say thank you to uh, Shayla and Margaret and the entire team for all the work that's been done uh, and uh, speaking in favor of its adoption. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, sir. Who do we have next? I've admitted Bob Chappelle into the meeting. Mr. Chappelle, can you hear us? Uh, yes, ma'am, I can. I hope that you can hear me, Margaret. I can. You're clear to address the commission. Thank you. One wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Bob Chappelle. I serve as the Chief Operating Officer a staff guy at the Mobile Area Chamber of Commerce located at 451 Government Street. My residence is 3003 Bryant Road. Uh, the chamber supports the city's effort to create a modern zoning code that will keep the city competitive both regionally and nationally. Our leadership has been engaged from the beginning of the process, including meeting with city officials and providing comments to the draft ordinances as they progress. We've also worked to keep our 1,800 member businesses informed on each new version of the draft ordinance as it has progressed. Modernizing and updating Mobile Zoning Ordinance is vitally important to keeping Mobile competitive with the cities we compete against for additional jobs and, and investment. Frankly, by nature of the, of the work, the updated codes are overdue and the city, the city has needed a more modern code that fits today's development needs. This has been a monumental undertaking and we very much appreciate the efforts of the city, both seeking input and guidance from as many stakeholders as possible and working to listen to the input and approve each version. Uh, UDC 4 represents a great start. It may not be perfect for everyone, and if so, we would hope that it would continue to evolve and to serve our community well. I'd simply wrap up by saying thank you to the, certainly to the staff, Shayla, and others who have worked so hard, but to the city leadership and members of the Planning Commission for your time and your efforts on this important work. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, that was our last speaker. 
Okay. <clears throat> Again, I want to thank all those who spoke for this. Your comments uh, and notes were, were heard and noted. Uh, we will address those comments or any questions that may have arised in our business session. Um, does staff have any further comments? Uh, yes, we would recommend that the commission hold a business meeting on Monday, March 8th at 2 p.m. Monday, March 8th at 2 p.m. Uh, Doug, does there need to be a motion for that? Mm -mm. Okay. Staff, of course, will send, um, you know, a meeting reminder, and that meeting will be live streamed. Okay. So we will tentatively look for staff to send out a meeting request for a business meeting uh, concerning things that were addressed today and our way forward uh, for Monday, the, the March 8th. And so we get Sorry. Correct. At, at two. two. Yes, sir. Okay, so we'll be looking for that. Do we have anything else? Can Can I ask a question, if I may, of the staff yeah. and the commission? Is that okay, Chair? Um, yes. Thank you. Um, we we had the booklet of the comments, but some people went into more detail. Is it possible to ask those speakers to maybe get that transcribed? Not, not asking the staff to transcribe it, asking the participant to, and then getting it to the commissioners on this um, planning commission so we can have it prior to that March 8th meeting. I, I tried to take some notes, but you know everyone was kind of going at a pace I, I really couldn't keep up with. And what we have is great, but some of them did list specific things I would like to see in writing if that's possible. Could we could we ask them to do that? It would be their choice. Yes, we can ask them to submit their comments that they presented at the meeting in writing. Great. Uh, while I understand the commission probably does not want to listen to the entire meeting again, I will also send you a link to the YouTube video so that you can go back and you know you'll have that immediate available and can scroll through the meeting, you know, to hear some of the pertinent things you're interested in again. Okay. okay. Great. Appreciate that. Anything else from commissioners? So, so I, it broke up a little bit. She, so we are doing the 8th at 2 p.m. Um, Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And, and I mean, I, I know we probably don't know this for certain, but I mean, do you, do you think this is going to be like an hour, hour and a half, two hours? What's the, what do you think? I would sus suspect it depends on how many questions and comments commissioners have to discuss amongst each other. Um, staff, any thoughts? I would suggest an hour to two hours. Uh, you know, the, I anticipate the commission having questions. Uh, I do believe the comments, how they were provided to you, really help identify the pinch points that are actually in the document. You know, it's not articles A through a, uh, one through appendix A, it's certain areas. And we will try and provide an outline to help focus the commission's work. Great. Hey, Margaret, this is Shirley Sessions. How soon will you get that invitation out? Uh, because my calendar get booked rather quickly. I, I, I have it penciled in, but something could happen. Uh, I can go ahead and send the appointment this afternoon before I leave, and that way it's on everyone's calendar. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other uh, Margaret, I, I may have missed something just a, a few minutes ago. I had to step away for a second, but, uh, and I think y'all may have been discussing what I'm about to ask. I'm not sure, but uh, is there going to be any effort made uh, by the staff and Shayla and her, her team to 
try to somewhat address each of the questions that were our concerns that were presented uh, in a way that we can sort of know where the staff is coming from before this meeting or are in this meeting. Uh, what council member Rich had asked is for the speakers if they so desire to provide their comments so that you have notes on that. What the staff is going to try and do is provide an outline based on the comments that you have to identify the sections in the UBC that um, have been identified as pinch points by the various speakers and commenters. Okay, so that'll, that'll have staff's responses to those concerns. More so identifying that for the commission and for you to make decisions on how to proceed based on those comments. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other questions, comments by commissioners? Anything else from staff? No, sir. Okay. Again, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for their participation. Thank all our speakers. I'd like to commend the staff for their work on this. Uh, we know it's a heavy lift, but we don't take it for granted. Uh, all your, your pain uh, and suffering and love to push this through. So uh, please stay in the fight. Um, hearing nothing else, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.